Good morning, everyone. My name is Simon Braidman, and I'm from Harrow Nature Heroes. I'd like to talk to you about wildlife in gardens. I have been wandering the streets where I live, looking at various front gardens. People have hard surface front gardens to park their cars, and in heavy rain, water cannot be absorbed, and this contributes to localised flooding during extreme weather events. This garden has pebbles, and some spiders may make their homes under the stonework. Increasingly, astroturf or slates are used in front gardens. A few invertebrates will shelter under these materials. However, the lack of plants in all three gardens means they are wildlife poor. Even a strip of grass or a border will improve them for nature as well as absorbing rainwater. This next front garden is a grass lawn containing a high proportion of white clover which will be good habitat for bees to forage in. There's also a small shape bush which will give some shelter but there's a general lack of structure within the garden and the range of plants available is poor. This garden is visually more attractive. The central lawn is cut very short and shows signs of wear creating bare soil which bees may nest in. The borders contain a variety of plants and shrubs providing pollen and nectar, but many of these are non-native plants. More native planting and a better lawn diversity will make this garden better for nature. The border that is pictured is highly structured and covered with evergreen shrubs which will create shelter for invertebrates, but almost all the planting is non-native species. Further along the street is a garden with a central area of long uncut grass with flowers growing within the sward. This will be a great area for wildlife. Around the edge of the garden is a cut privet hedge which will give food and shelter. If you combine a board of UK native plants plus a hedge and the long grass, one has created a garden with considerable wildlife value. Around a low block of flats is this open space. It has trees which aren't in the picture. It also has bare ground and short and long grass with bramble scrub. This is an excellent area for wildlife. Birds may nest in a bramble. More diversity within the grass and would improve the area still further. This is me standing in my lovely front garden. I love this space because it changes constantly. A variety of plants come into maturity throughout the year as they want to provide a constant supply of nectar and pollen for pollinators and plants to eat for herbivorous invertebrates. This picture was taken in early April with gorse in its full yellow glory. Gorse is spiky and dense and provides spiders with anchor points for their webs. In flower also are bluebell, grape hyacinth, feel forget me not and rosemary. By late June, the garden looks overgrown and the gorse has gone to seed, but other flowers have reached maturity and the invertebrates can take advantage. Particularly important have been the hawkweeds and the field scabious. Pink colour comes from Herb Robert and Shining Cranesville, and Red Valerian provides nectar for butterflies. By not collecting autumn windblown leaves and compost spillage, a thin layer of soil is built up between the pots allowing plants to spread naturally. At least six species of grass grow in the front garden, as well as stinging nettle, cleavers and ribwort plantain. Here are some close-ups of some of the flowers that are out at the moment. Field scabious is a member of the teasel family and it's beloved by insects such as hoverflies, bees and butterflies. It has lots of tiny flowers clustered onto one flower head. Purple loosestrife is a wetland plant with long purple vertical spikes and a good use of space. Common toad flax is a bumblebee plant and in this garden it's eaten by the caterpillar of the toad flax brocade moth. Daisies are really important because each flower head contains lots of tiny flowers packed together. And in this garden, we've got common knapweed and chicory, amongst others. Finally, hedge woundwort is one of the dead nettle family with deep nectaries and bees get stamped with pollen as they push their heads into the flower. By next week, some of the flowers will have been pollinated and start to wither, but already others are about to open, such as this wild carrot. The overall aim 
is to achieve structural complexity by growing long and short grass, flowers of different shapes and sizes, and trees and bushes. These create all the lots of microhabitats for invertebrates to live in. In a good wildlife garden, you'll find a wide range of insects and other invertebrates. Here is a snapshot of some of the invertebrates that we have found in our garden. Enjoy this lovely sequence of pictures with a blackbird singing in the background. Let's have a look at the extra features to boost the wildlife value of your garden. A pond is the single most important species habitat. Even a bucket or washing up bowl sunk into the ground will attract both land and water animals. It is it's imp quite important to try to make sure that it's not tap water because this adds too many nutrients to the pond, but try to use rainwater if at all possible. The previous picture shows a well-vegetated, mature pond. Our pond was dug in February 2020. It has a liner and a pond underlay laid into the pond contours. It filled with rainwater and then the liner was cut to shape and buried beneath low nutrient clay. All the banks have shallow slopes and the banks and the bottom of the pond were covered in stonework of different grades, from fine grit and sand to larger pebbles. No topsoil was added and any exposed liner was buried in low nutrient clay. The pond has not been planted up except for a few plants to allow the pond to develop slowly, but already it is full of life. Lots of tiny invertebrates jumping through the water, water fleas and copy pods, as you can see in this footage. The fencing is an integral part of the garden structure. Fencing can be used to support climbing plants such as ivy and honeysuckle. It's also key to allow free passage between gardens to create wildlife corridors. The home range of garden mammals and others extends over more than one garden. We have put a, in a post and rail fence which allows hedgehogs easy access, helping hedgehogs avoid roads. A 13cm by 13cm hole in a solid fence will do the same job. Ivy, in my view, is a must-have for any garden. It's an evergreen plant providing all year round shelter. It flowers late in the year after most flower plants have finished flowering and insects swarm all around the flowers. The berries are rich in nutrients and the plant is a flu plant of the holly blue butterfly caterpillar. This year we had a blackbird nest in the ivy. It is really important to have dead wood in the garden. One in eight of all invertebrates live all or part of their lives in that habitat. Dead wood in full sunlight, dappled light, shade and water are all useful conditions. Buried dead wood is also important for stag beetles. By using dead wood, you may attract this stunning solitary wasp called Ectemnius. This wasp does not sting its us, but it stings flies to paralyse them and takes them back to its tunnel in dead wood and lays an egg on the victim and the wasp larva feeds on the living fly. Another essential habitat is the compost heap. Lots of animals make their homes in both wet and dry compost heaps from tiny wood lice to hedgehogs. Every garden should have trees. They provide shade, hiding places, nesting material, perches, a food web and structural complexity. They also give very important rain and wind shelter. Trees ideally should be native species as our wildlife is adapted to it. 
They can be kept small by growing dwarf varieties planted to pots or grown as a hedge. Oak, willow and birches are the best for wildlife. You can also grow climbers through trees. In our garden, we grow hazel, willow, blackthorn, hawthorn, elder, Lawson cypress and cotoneaster. Our line of cypress has had singing goldcrest and breeding magpie. Flowering grass is a habitat that people don't tend to have in their gardens. Some invertebrates like grasshoppers and crickets prefer them. Grass grown in tussocks hides overwintering invertebrates and I consider long grass to be so important while they grow it in pots. In the first picture is a pot growing coxfoot grass, a broad leafed coarse grass whose packed flower heads resemble the feet of chickens. The beautifully named Yorkshire fog is common in the front garden with pink fringed flowers, soft hairy stems and leaves. If you look carefully at the third image, one can see the yellowish flecks which are the single flowers of common bent grass. The last image shows a skeletal frame of rough meadow grass after the seeds have dropped. Keep the frame, it's good for spider webs. The best thing is to grow a mixture of long and short grass, as short grass is good for birds hunting soil invertebrates. We have two sunflower seed feeders, three niger seed feeders and a fat ball feeder. The niger seed feeders are designed for goldfinch beaks, but he loves sunflower hearts too and are reluctant to give way to the blue tits and great tits which tend to come and go. Other visitors include green finches and robins. Starlings, house sparrows and now jackdaws love the fat balls. And a great spotted woodpecker visits irregularly and climbs the washing line post. We give live food mealworms during the breeding season for growing chicks and all feeders are cleaned once a week with hot water. This year we had white-tailed bumblebee nesting in the garden for the first time. The queen decided that underneath our garden shed was a safe place and now it is almost a constant stream of worker bees flying in and out. The bees have been seen gathering at curled up ends of blackthorn shoots. I believe they are seeking out honeydew, the sweet secretion of aphids. I hope by watching this film you'll be encouraged to make small changes to attract wildlife into your garden. Please keep in touch with Harrenic Heroes and thank you for watching.